Hello everyone, and welcome to the third plagiarized episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Kathleen Kennedy from Disney Lucasfilm. Today, we will be discussing the instance of a producer who found her way to the top of one of the biggest film franchises in history, and far too late did people realize she had absolutely no talent whatsoever. I think before we begin, it's first important to note what a producer is, since that's always what Kathleen Kennedy has been, a film producer. One can easily look up Kathleen Kennedy's filmography, and she has been shown to be involved in over a dozen critically acclaimed films, and this seems to be the main defense for her modern day incompetence, that she wouldn't simply forget how to produce a film, but this argument comes from the lack of understanding of what a film producer actually is. In fact, being a producer means absolutely nothing when it comes to filmmaking talent. A film producer is commonly someone who finances and oversees a film's production, and may even do things like book filming locations. But none of those three things have anything to do with talent. And in fact, a common reason films may fail is because the producer messed with the production of the film and ruined it for everybody. One of the most notable examples being Spider-Man 3. Avi Arad is commonly cited as the one who ruined that movie, and he was one of the producers. As the story goes, Sam Raimi had originally planned for Sandman and Harry Osborn to be the main antagonists, but Avi Arad and other Sony executives requested for him to include Venom, something which Sam Raimi was uncomfortable with doing, as he wasn't confident he could do Venom justice. However, the executives would not change their minds, and eventually, they all came to a compromise. That Sam Raimi would include both Sandman and Venom, as well as Harry Osborn as the second Green Goblin. And with Venom being a major point of contention with Spider-Man 3, it's clear that Sam Raimi was right all along, and Venom did indeed make an inferior film. Keep this story in mind as we continue with Kathleen Kennedy. So first, some history. Kathleen Kennedy was born on the 5th of June 1953 in Berkeley, California, and entered the film industry in the late 1970s. As many will know, she assisted Steven Spielberg with many of his films, and eventually, she came to become president of Lucasfilm after the acquisition by Disney. But how exactly did she get the position in the first place? Well, George Lucas had trusted her too much. George Lucas had known her for decades, and had faith that she would continue the Star Wars franchise effectively. There is the famous clip where she said that she would continue the characters in the way George Lucas created them. And we also know that George Lucas considered Bob Iger his friend too. So it was a case of George Lucas trusting the wrong people to continue on without him. Because the decline of Star Wars can be majorly attributed to both people. However, this video is analyzing Kathleen Kennedy not Bob Iger, so I'll only mention Bob Iger when relevant. Now, as soon as they both got control of Star Wars, they went back on their agreements with George, at least those that weren't directly in the acquisition contract, and they made a lot of misguided, incompetent decisions. For one, they decided to greenlight a sequel trilogy immediately after the acquisition, and the way they did it was a huge mistake. For something as important as making a sequel trilogy without the direct involvement of George Lucas, a key plan of how the trilogy would play into itself and the rest of the Star Wars saga would be important. A key weakness of Star Wars under Kathleen Kennedy is that they are extremely reactive to how the general audience react to the movies and shows they make. During the production of The Force Awakens, the main goal was to sweep the Star Wars prequels under the rug and basically only referenced the original trilogy, which of course was a major mistake that built off reactive tendencies. As I've stated many times on this channel, if they did not want to make a sequel to the Star Wars saga, then they should have completely rebooted the Star Wars universe. Another mistake Kathleen Kennedy made was hiring J.J. Abrams, who was one of the laziest, most unoriginal filmmakers in history. At the time, J.J. Abrams had only directed a mere four movies under his belt, and with the exception of Super 8, all of them were derivative off of other people's creations. This includes Mission Impossible and Star Trek, derivative off of the creations of Bruce Geller and Gene Roddenberry. J.J. Abrams was, at best, an imitator, and J.J. Abrams also played into the main flaw of Lucasfilm, a reactionary mindset. 
J.J. Abrams, like many who work with or at modern day Lucasfilm, are hardened prequel haters, who consider those three movies the bane of their existence, and on top of that, have next to zero range when it comes to anything else. So right off the bat, Kathleen Kennedy chose the wrong people to make Star Wars movies in the future. As said, directors were extremely biased against the prequels, instead of being filmmakers who love all of Star Wars universally. But the thing about Kathleen Kennedy herself is that she doesn't hold any great love for Star Wars herself, as she has not faithfully continued the franchise the way George Lucas created it. Like many arrogant people who inherit a franchise, she's more concerned to bending Star Wars into what she wants, rather than something George Lucas would be happy with. You probably know where I'm going with this, the pandering. But there's something important to point out about the pandering that people don't usually talk about. It's insincere. After all, Kathleen Kennedy now works at the same company that filmed near a Chinese concentration camp when trying to pander to the Chinese audience with the Milan remake, and it backfired in their faces. Now Kathleen Kennedy as far as anyone knows had nothing to do with that, but it demonstrates how someone as high ranking as Kathleen Kennedy can hide behind the mask of inclusivity and diversity, that they'll use it to manipulate their audiences through gaslighting and straw manning. This is a rampant problem in Star Wars. It doesn't take more than a minute of research to discover that the four same-sex kiss found in the Rise of Skywalker was cut in Arabic versions of the movie. A lot of the support Disney has garnered from the politically correct masses are actually built on a lie. Granted, it's also their fault for being dumb enough to not realize Disney is only pandering to them to win them over. Because including a black guy artificially is far easier than writing a compelling story most of everyone will enjoy. It's a tactic to get the most amount of people on their side with the least amount of effort. So as much as Kathleen Kennedy may seem to be woke, it's actually all a facade. And I think this is something even most Disney Star Wars haters don't fully understand either. But when looking at the evidence, it becomes more than clear. Kathleen Kennedy is the kind of villain who tries to prop themselves up as a multiculturalist, but the reality is far from that. And it's not like the company she works for is above taking a loss. As one of the largest entertainment corporations in the world, they are fully capable of not releasing their movies in countries like China, Russia, and all the Arabic nations if they genuinely cared about proving a point. But unfortunately, this is the exception rather than the rule. While it is known that various Marvel and Pixar movies were banned in the Middle East for LGBT references, most of those films were lower profile releases. This includes Lightyear, The Marvels, Eternals, etc. So Disney is definitely not above having their movies banned in conservative or religious countries. They're a multi-billion dollar corporation. They can take a loss. But in Star Wars' case, I couldn't find any major Star Wars releases that were banned in any regions under Disney. And if any of them were going to be banned, it would be The Rise of Skywalker. But it wasn't. And that's because they censored the same sex kiss that already was obviously only in there to tick off a box. But with this additional context, it becomes clear that Kathleen Kennedy really doesn't care about inclusivity and diversity at all, but is perfectly fine with hiding behind it when it proves beneficial. Disney Star Wars is literally the definition of, I'm not racist, I have plenty of black friends. And another thing to point out, that as much as shows like The Acolyte call itself the gayest or most inclusive Star Wars show, it's worth noting that it's absolutely nothing to write home about. Being made in the 2020s, it's easier than ever to have a multicultural and ethnically diverse cast more than ever. The Acolyte is not breaking new boundaries, nor is it ahead of its time. A more remarkable example of what constitutes what the Acolyte is pretending to be is perhaps the original Star Trek series, in which its first episode came out in 1966, a mere two years after the Civil Rights Bill was passed. Star Trek was incredibly ahead of its time, featuring an African American woman in a prominent role that wasn't a house servant, as many shows beforehand tended to do, and having a Japanese American man 
also there as a representation of all of Asia. That is what you call ahead of its time. And it's known that Martin Luther King Jr. even specifically asked Uhura's actress to stay on the show when she was considering opting out. Because having a major African American character was a big deal back then. As someone who has watched every episode of the original series on top of that, I can also say that the stories don't focus on the ethnicities of the characters whatsoever. It was more about trekking across space and the universe, and what interesting adventures come from that. Needless to say, it was a lot more authentic than what the Acolyte was doing. The Acolyte being made in the 2020s, decades after shows like Star Trek had to break the boundaries of diversity, the Acolyte is nothing more than fluff. So Kathleen Kennedy and anyone under her really don't have the right to brag about inclusivity or diversity, but they do. Because it's the easiest way to get the most amount of people to side with them with the least amount of effort. Again, if Disney Star Wars had decided to write stories as incompetently as they are now, and their shows were not woke at all, it's doubtful they could retain as much support as they are now. And that's why the tactic is effective. Kathleen Kennedy is preying on people who have been left out of pop culture largely for a long time, such as the LGBT community, and trying to artificially appeal to them, to get them on her side. And unfortunately, it has worked on a lot of them. There are, however, people who are gay or trans that dislike the shallow pandering as much as the next guy. But it's easy to see with these observations how Kathleen Kennedy can pretend that people who don't or won't fall for their artificial inclusivity are just homophobic bigots. This sort of gaslighting is extremely easy to do, and it's become tragically common. Take, for example, Disney's tweet gaslighting people and telling them not to be a racist. This was a blatant case of gaslighting at the fans, designed to make them even more angry and enrage them. And as I pointed out, it's incredibly hypocritical on the part of Kathleen Kennedy and Disney as a company. But another thing that confirms that this was mostly a fabricated narrative, that the fan base struggles with racism or whatever, is what they did when the same thing happened to Cameron Monaghan, the actor who portrays Cal Kestis, and what they did was absolutely nothing. People back when Fallen Order was properly revealed were tweeting out how Cal Kestis was a boring white male protagonist. And not once did the Star Wars Twitter page go out in defense of Cameron Monaghan. And unlike private Instagram messages Moses Ingram received, people were very openly tweeting their anti-white bigotry, and they were far easier to find. It can also be argued that people who tweeted their sentiment against Cal Kestis were extremely ungrateful, because with the exception of Han Solo, there hadn't been a single white male protagonist for the longest time. Rey was the star of the sequel trilogy, Jin Erso was the star of Rogue One, Ezra was an Arabic guy who was the star of Rebels, and Aiden Versio was the star of the Battlefront 2 campaign, the video game that preceded Fallen Order. And as well as that, there's hardly been a white male protagonist since, with the exception of Kenobi, or maybe Dooku. Andor is Mexican, Mando is Chilean, Ahsoka is played by a woman, and so on. White male protagonists have literally become the exception rather than the rule. And it demonstrates actually that politically correct people want white male characters to be sidelined, or at the very least, have something about them that makes them different from the archetype. This might include the ridicule Sam Maggs received for making Luke Skywalker bisexual, when that was never a thing in the past 40 plus years of him existing. So the important thing that should be asked is, does racism actually exist in the Star Wars fanbase? Well yes, of course. Racism can happen with anything, but Kathleen Kennedy seizes every opportunity she can to paint angry fans as the villains. Criticizing the insincere pandering to demographics is not bigotry whatsoever. It's actually pointing out hypocrisy that Disney would gaslight other people, with many skeletons lying in their own closet. Kathleen Kennedy is fully aware of this, but she's openly pretending to be inclusive. 
Kathleen Kennedy, after all, is a highly privileged woman in a high-ranking position at a company. But she seizes the opportunity to make other people look bad to disguise the fact that she's simply an incompetent leader. And it may also be to misdirect people. As stated before, the pandering does work in getting politically correct woke nut jobs to support what she's doing. And they themselves can be stuck in their own fantasy land. That they can't look at the objective fact that Kathleen Kennedy is faking all of her representation. It's become more than obvious that Kathleen Kennedy is prioritizing getting diverse people to be in her Star Wars productions rather than someone who's actually right for the role. And it's become easier to do than before. It's a facade to surround herself with people of color or whoever else to appear to be inclusive when she couldn't really give less of a shit. Now, I don't think Kathleen Kennedy is a white supremacist obviously, but she is certainly a wolf hiding in sheep's clothing. Manipulating people into thinking you're a multiculturalist is an easy way to make people think you have noble intentions, but Kathleen Kennedy's track record shows that all the representation that happens is completely superficial. As while Kathleen certainly does not hate minorities, she doesn't legitimately care for them either. She sees them more as a means to win stupid people obsessed with diversity over, and it gives her the illusion of an excuse to morally grandstand other people who see right through it. Because as much as people explain they're against forced pandering rather than natural inclusivity, it's easy to paint them as the insincere ones. Because Kathleen Kennedy is the one surrounding herself with people of color and the gay community and whoever else. But as always, in today's age, it's extremely important to recognize that pandering the way Kathleen Kennedy does can always be insincere. Doing something out of pragmatism always must be considered. And for Kathleen Kennedy, she certainly fits the bill of everything she does being out of selfish reasons, but disguising it as a favor for different ethnic groups or for the LGBT. Now, when it comes to her selfishness, this can be seen all over Star Wars. Previously, I stated how a producer has absolutely zero filmmaking talent, and if they interfere too much, they can contribute to a film's failure. Kathleen Kennedy has been known to meddle with most major Star Wars projects, minus The Last Jedi ironically, which says a lot when one of the worst major pieces of Star Wars content had a full blessing. Perhaps a notable example of Kathleen's interference was Solo A Star Wars Story. The original directors, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, were fired by Kathleen Kennedy. Apparently the tone for Solo were completely different to what Kathleen wanted, so she fired the pair and had most of the film reshot with Ron Howard. Now keep in mind, a producer by default is a key reason a film can fail, and Solo, being the complete mess it was, can be blamed mostly on Kathleen Kennedy. Something similar can be said with Rogue One A Star Wars Story 2. As I heard, Rogue One was going to be a larger film in scope, and include more of Saw Gerrera, who was barely in the film, but Kathleen Kennedy interfered, and while Rogue One was well received by most people, it could have been potentially so much better, and it can all be blamed on Kathleen's interference that it wasn't. Gareth Edwards still managed to get a solid film out of it, however. It actually seems that any projects that Kathleen Kennedy and Disney do stay away from actually end up being better received than what they interfere with. As dull and boring Andor was, it did not break Star Wars lore, and seems to be the only show since the Clone Wars micro-series that did so. Fallen Order and Survivor likely had the same development story too, since it's well known that Disney doesn't really care about the video game division of Star Wars games, having gotten rid of LucasArts immediately into their dark reign. So when it's left alone, or without the extreme watchful eye of Disney, there is potential for something great, or at the very least inoffensive to come out. But if that's the case, then Kathleen Kennedy deserves absolutely no credit for it. If you're just a film producer after all, it doesn't mean you have talent. And in fact, you can be the very reason a movie or show or anything else utterly flops and fails. So that's Kathleen Kennedy, a woman who manipulated George and then the world into thinking she cared about Star Wars by feigning support to minorities to win them over, gaslighting the people who didn't fall for it, interfering with every project minus The Last Jedi ironically, and overall has nothing to ride home about. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Analyzing Evil. What do you think about Kathleen Kennedy? Leave your thoughts below. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories but mystery boxes? Under the mountain.